This is one of my favorite topics. I mean, this is just pure fun. There is so much that you can do in a relatively short amount of time. For as long as we've been property owners and hunters, we've constantly strived to create and grow the best food plots possible for the wildlife. But the one thing we haven't paid quite enough attention to are timber until now. Welcome back to another episode of The Off Season. For this episode, we'll once again be joining our good friend Kip Adams and Dr. Craig Harper as part of the NDA series. Today, they will demonstrate and walk us through two common practices when it comes to controlling a stand of timber to benefit the wildlife. Now, understanding the how is great, and you will learn that today, but in this case, you also need to understand the why. First, as land managers, we're going to use these practices solely to benefit the wildlife and not our financial interests. Thus, why most people use the term forest stand improvement and not timber stand improvement. We also need to understand the overall goal of these practices is to encourage the regeneration of the forest. Meaning, we are harvesting the mature trees that are dominating the canopy and not allowing the sunlight to reach the forest floor in order to promote fresh growth. In almost all cases, hardwood trees will regenerate naturally in the form of thousands of saplings, which act as great cover and browse for the deer. Now, you can harvest these trees in one of two ways. The first is what's called a clear cut. This is what the name implies, meaning you clear the ground of all trees, allowing the sun to hit the dirt directly, producing a very thick track of timber. The other technique is called a shelter wood cut. This is when you selectively cut some trees and leave others. This creates thick areas of shelter while maintaining some open timber at the same time. And finally, you can harvest these trees in several ways. But today, Kip and Dr. Harper are going to demonstrate girdling a tree as well as falling a tree. Both of these are great ways of managing your forest and creating habitat for the wildlife on your property. On the next thing on the agenda then, I had said we talk about forests and old fields and food plots. We're gonna start with forests, part of it. So uh, we'll come in here, Dr. Harper will talk some of the concepts through this, and then we're gonna show you some work that we actually did in here yesterday. Um, stuff that you all can do right at places that you either own or, or manage or, or whatever. And not that this is the only way to do things, this will be one example of something, ways to create better hunting opportunities, more food, more cover, uh, et cetera. So, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's follow uh, Dr. Craig and we'll come out and uh, let him get started. So, obviously we're looking at uh, a maple, thin bark, and we're just cutting through the, the bark deep enough to spray that inner layer where the cambium is. And it's only like, you know, yay thick. Yes, and, and we'll do it here in a second. And then we come with the uh, herbicide mixture, triclopyr, amazapyr, and water. And uh, I think we're gonna mix some even, but it's 50% uh, Garlon 3A, 40% water, and 10% Arsenal AC mixed in that order. If you put the Garlon and the Arsenal on top of each other, it'll gel in the bottle. But uh, that mixture will kill any tree that you treat. Pretty quick. So that's all that's needed. I mean, you're just barely getting inside the, the bark, and then... It's great to work with it as a team and have one person doing that and one person behind, and with this, literally just getting it into the wound and that's it. There's a blue dye that's added, so you can clearly see where you have been or not, so you could do, you're not double getting some trees or missing some, but then you just have one person follow behind that person. And now the tree's dead and we've done a fair amount of this in terms of calculating. We can treat about eight acres a day, me and one other person, and that's on a short winter day. 
So, I mean, what else are you doing in February? It's fun. And, and the results are, are truly significant. So we're going from literally 25, perhaps 100 pounds of deer forage per acre to on average 800 pounds per acre. And we have gotten and measured up to 1,400 pounds and that is only select deer forages and the portions of the plant that deer eat. That's not you know, the amount of biomass. That's the amount of actual deer food. So uh, when you go from, let's just say 100 pounds per acre to 800 pounds per acre, that's significant. And usually the difference is, is much greater than that. All right, let's talk about felling a tree and we'll actually cut one down. This can be extremely dangerous even if you do know what you're doing. However, the more you understand about what's going on with this, the, the better job you can do with this or make a decision to fell it or just go ahead and girdle it. In some cases, I want the tree for firewood or I just need to get it down, so we want you to understand how to do it anyway. The proper way in felling a tree, and we have an article on our website about this as well, we are gonna cut a notch. We, we chose, you know, we wanted the tree to go this way. It was leaning slightly. So we cut a notch on the side, the tree's gonna go. This is the notch that I cut out. This notch should be cut back in about a quarter of the diameter of the tree. So farther than that, you start to lose some control. Less than that, you don't have as much control with regard to where you want it to go. So in a quarter. And when I put this in, my lower cut, I always make sure is not parallel with the ground. I come lower. The reason for that is when this tree falls, I want to make sure that hits the ground before my tree hits the bottom of that. And as you can see here where that did look, that tree was down and I had a little bit of a gap there. That is important because if it, that gap wasn't there and this hit the bottom of my hinge before that hit the ground, what's going to happen to this tree? Boom, and it's going right back that way in a very dangerous situation. So always, I always get that down a little bit. So you put your notch in, then we come and we can either do the felling cut, which is from the back toward it, or we can do a plunge cut where we plunge right into the tree and then saw out the back. That is the safest way if the tree is big enough to be able to do it. If you're cutting a smaller tree, there's just not room. But if the tree is big enough, and this one was plenty big enough, to plunge your saw in, that is the safest because this piece right here we see in the middle, this is called the hinge. The hinge is the most important part of this whole thing. The hinge is what holds this tree while you do the felling cut and it allows it to safely fall in the way that you want it to. So when we cut into this, you never ever cut all the way up to your notch because then this tree can twist, it can spin, you have no control over it. This hinge that's there, and that should be at least 10% of what the diameter of the tree is, I always like to have it at least two inches, even on a tree like this, that's less than 20 inches across. So we leave that part because then as you can see, as this tree falls, you can come up here and look, this is what was controlled. And everybody, there was some of the film guys were here, we're all here. How slowly did this tree fall yesterday? They cut it out, we walked back and it was about this fast, all the way down, which creates a safe situation. If something happened, plenty of time for us to get out of the way. So, but that is all predicated on that hinge. And you can see how this pulled up as it went. So it ended up perfect. Now, it doesn't always go perfectly, but if you understand those steps and do those each time, you put yourself in the best case scenario for safe felling, getting it where you want. So, all right.
Let's see how I did. Come on back. You can see good on here now that this has gone the hinge all the way across. It's carefully went slowly with that. Everything worked out well. Two more things I'll say on this one. Wedges are an incredibly good tool to have. These are inexpensive. I never go to the woods without them. They are great if you get your saw pinched. You can pound these in you know, to get it out. If the trees lean a little bit one way, you can use these to, to make it go, keep going. So, uh, and then obviously they're made of plastic. So I've hit mine with saws, you know, trying to get them out, but uh, very good piece to have. The last thing with a saw, when you're running it, always, always have the hand that's on the bar. And of course I run this backwards. I run it left-handed. This bar, your thumb has to be wrapped around that bar. That is so much safer than if you have your thumb up on the side. You have so much more control if that's wrapped underneath, if the saw kicks back. So never run your hand up on the side, no matter how cool you think it looks, wrap it around and you have a far uh, more control of the saw. Whether you have 50 acres or 5,000, forest stand improvement is something that can drastically improve the habitat on your property and ultimately the hunting as well. Kip mentioned something during this class that I believe is a great wrap up to this episode. He said, in theory, the forest on your property should provide almost all the nutrition and forage a deer needs. Your food plots are just a great way to supplement this and put your wildlife over the top. I think this is a great point and one us land managers should always keep in mind. A major goal I have for my property is to do exactly that. Establish desirable habitat that will shelter and feed our wildlife herd year round. I hope you enjoyed this episode as part of the NDA series. And as always, thanks for watching another episode of The Off Season.